is, is the cancer cell is very smart, and we have to be equally smart, and thinking that a single therapy is going to eradicate the disease is probably somewhat naive. So I'm going to skip over a lot of the preamble about the history, and suffice it to say, we have lots of drugs in this space. We have tamoxifen, which has been around for uh, 40 years at this point. We have aromatase inhibitors, exemestane, uh, and astrazole, letrozole. We have uh, somewhat newer drugs like fulvestrin. And those things have been very useful for women who have both early stage and advanced uh, disease. And in particular, in advanced disease, we tend to use these drugs in sequence. We try to avoid chemotherapy if we don't have to use it initially. We know inevitably patients with metastatic disease more often than not will get chemotherapy, but because the uh, toxicity or side effect profile of anti-hormone therapy is so much more favorable than chemotherapy, we always try to use anti-hormone therapy for as long as we can. So we often go from one to the other to the, the other until there's a demonstration that anti-hormone therapy doesn't work or the nature of the disease has changed. Either it's moving more rapidly or it's bulky where you feel obligated to use something like chemotherapy. So in the last couple of years, what's changed about using endocrine therapy is we've started to exploit our underlying knowledge of how those freeway pathways work. So that if you give anti-hormone therapy alone, you're probably affecting a fraction of patients favorably, but inevitably, like chemotherapy, like anti her 2 therapy, the disease figures out how to bypass that. And frequently, how it does that is one of those alternative pathways becomes dominant. We call these signaling pathways. And what has happened in the last few years is there's been the development of a number of different drugs, and Kathy referred to one, uh, the mTOR inhibitor, Everlimus, that was demonstrated that if you combine it with anti-hormone therapy, you can potentially overcome some of that resistance and enhance the effect of the anti-hormone therapy where it's given, you know, it's better than giving the anti-hormone therapy alone. So we've entered the era where we're starting to talk about cocktails, where anti-hormonal therapy is not given alone, but often in combination with other things. The upside of that is that it appears to be more effective. The downside is it comes with its own set of side effects unique to what we would have traditionally thought of as anti-hormonal therapy. So for example, uh, if you get the mTOR inhibitor Everlimus with an anti-hormonal therapy, which is largely, relatively speaking, innocuous, or side effects, but not compared to chemotherapy, you start picking up some of the side effects of chemotherapy. And then more recently, which I'll proceed on, is this whole class of drugs referred to as CD4-6 inhibitors, which are drugs like uh, uh, Ibrance, which you may have heard of. Uh, there are other drugs in, in development, which I'm going to talk about, about the cyclid, ribocyclid. Calbocyclid is the uh, generic name for uh, Ibrance. And the reason these drugs were developed is because, again, a very simplistic slide that shows you a circle, but as a cell migrates through the cell cycle, in order for it to divide, divide and sort of uh, make progenitors, more cells, a number of things have to happen. DNA has to divide, things have to be replicated, and there are checks and balances on this progression through the cell cycle, and there are very there are molecular mechanisms that control the progression of the cell through the pathway. And these checkpoints, which are sort of simplistically put, you know, at each of these different areas, control how the cell goes through that, uh, through that progression of the cell cycle. And if it's unregulated, as it is in cancer, you get huge numbers of cancer cells developing. So the checks and balances that you might see in a normal cell are absent, these breaks. So when you have acceleration or lack of breaks going through the cell cycle, you can get, uh, you know, obviously progression of a disease that you don't want, in this case cancer. And the, the, the goal of trying to understand this is to develop ways of targeting those breaks to shut the cells off. And therein lies the whole role of CD4-6 inhibitors. So I thought In that order to better understand the biology of the cell This is my first concerning opinion. We have prepared some animation that illustrate these points. One approach to treating advanced estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is by targeting the cell cycle. In a healthy cell, 
the cell cycle is well controlled. However, in a cancer cell, the cell cycle is deregulated for mutations or upstream signals, causing cancer cells to proliferate at faster rates than healthy cells. For example, in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells, the deregulation of the cell cycle is caused by the overexpression and overactivation of growth factor and estrogen receptor pathways. When these pathways become activated, they instigate a cascade of mitogenic signals. A wide variety of mitogenic signaling pathways converge at the level of cyclin D1 messenger RNA and protein upregulation. Cyclin D1 binds to and activates cell cycle dependent protein kinases, or CDK, 4 and 6. The activated cyclin D1 CDK46 complex mediates the phosphorylation and inactivation of the tumor suppressor retinoblastoma protein. In a normal state, activated RB protein inhibits the cell cycle from progressing through the G1 phase. The phosphorylation of the RB or retinoblastoma protein releases E2F transcription factors from the protein complex causing the cell cycle to progress from G1 to S phase and resulting in cancer cell proliferation. I was just saying that. So you're not going to be tested on that, I assure you. But the whole notion is that there is obviously something very complicated going on that controls the progression through the cell cycle normally and in pathologic uh, situations like in cancer. So there is a very specific strategy for how you affect that pathway, and that's the rationale for developing these drugs. And the, you know, each one of these things, Kathy was talking about Valero trials with reference to one kind of drug. Every one of the companies that develop these drugs, they have to have a catchy acronym. The Paloma trials, there's the Mona Lisa trials, there's uh, the Monarch trials. But the Paloma trials really led to the approval of palbocyclic, or we often refer to it as palbo. And this is the drug commercially known as Ibrance. And again, the, the point I would really suggest to you on this slide is what these trials demonstrated that is if you give an anti-hormone therapy alone versus an anti-hormone therapy plus the targeted therapy, in this case palbocyclin, what was demonstrated uniformly across the uh, trials is that there was an enhancement in the duration until the disease progressed. Now, we'd like to say that the disease went away and it never came back. That's not the case, unfortunately. But the time until it happened was double what had been seen before. So using these agents in an appropriate patient has allowed the time until you have to go on to the next therapy to actually double. And it's actually uh, as a result of this that the drug was actually approved. And I would say, at least with respect to this drug, uh, the added toxicity is largely uh, laboratory, meaning the patients generally feel fine. They do have an effect on their blood counts, and we have to monitor that. But it's not chemotherapy. People generally feel quite, quite good while they're taking this therapy. Uh, the trial that was presented at ASCO this year, uh, just a couple of weeks or a week ago, I'm getting, forgetting what it seems like a continuous thing since ASCO, a week ago is this drug called abemocyclin. So there are three drugs in development, palbocyclin, abemocyclin, ribocyclin, all targeting the same pathway. Whether all three will get approved by the FDA remains to be seen. But this drug was actually reported as a single agent, not combined with anything. And you know the rationale for thinking about using it in that manner is if you think about chemotherapy in patients who've had prior therapy, uh, in other words, they've had metastatic disease, they've gone through a series of different drugs, you would ask, what's the likelihood of benefiting from chemotherapy? And at least with some of the drugs we use, you know, we, we, we don't see a home run, so to speak. There's a fraction of patients that benefit, but unfortunately, it's a small fraction. So the rationale for looking at monotherapy is how would it fare against, you know, what we know to be historically a relatively low likelihood of responding. And again, a complicated slide, but this is the response rate. So it's about 20%, which is, very similar to what you see with chemotherapy. And I would highlight the fact that abemocyclin, which is a cousin of palbocyclin, is not being developed to stand alone. It's really being developed to be combined with anti-hormone therapy, like the aromatase inhibitors, like fulvestrin. But it does have some anti-tumor activity, even by itself. 
And the side effects are a little bit different than calvocyclin, a little bit more diarrhea, but less of an effect on the blood counts. So this drug is farther back, not yet approved, and you know, we'll wait for the other trials to see if this drug, as well as another one called ribocyclin, are unique compared to one another, or whether or not um, we, we need all three. Maybe one will, all, will, will be the only one that's approved. And the other question that will be asked eventually is if you receive one of these drugs, what is the effect on subsequent therapy? Mm -hmm. So will these drugs work after you've had, say, palpocyclin? Or will other anti-hormone therapy work equally well? We don't know the results of that. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, is the era of just giving tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors sort of all by themselves gone? Or do we have to combine everything with something? And I would just let you know, and I think Kathy alluded to this, most of the therapies we have are extraordinarily expensive. And drugs like Ibrance, a pill you take on a daily basis, uh, three out of four weeks, is about twelve to fourteen thousand dollars a month. It's actually extraordinary to think about. Mm. Um, so that obviously, if you have insurance, that's good. But you know, a lot of patients, that's a problem. And it's just a problem for the economics of our society if every drug we have is costing that much per month. So we have to think about very critically whether or not there are patients that can do well in the absence of these drugs, because some patients have very indolent hormone-sensitive disease, and as a result, could get away with tamoxifen, or an aromatase inhibitor, or fulvestrin all by themselves. And there are other trials that are still exploring that question, comparing anti-hormone therapies to each other to see if you can get an equal time to the disease progressing as you might with these combinations. Let me switch gears then to what is the immune system. I think that this has gotten a lot of attention in oncology, and I would also, in the next breath, say a lot of hype. So we have to temper our enthusiasm by what the data is at the present time, at least in breast cancer. Uh, trying to harness the immune system has been something that's been a focus of oncology for three to four decades. Uh, in breast cancer, vaccine development, as an example, has been ongoing for 30 years, and, as you know. There is no vaccine for breast cancer. So this is not a new idea, but I think our understanding of the mechanics of the immune system have, have really been enhanced. So the immune system, a network of organ tissue and cells that really are meant to defend your, your body from outside invaders. So whether it's a bacterial organism, whether it's a cancer that looks different than normal cells, your body is meant to get rid of that so that it doesn't harm the organism. And very simplistically, if you think about our human body, there are all kinds of tissues in the human body, from our tonsils to our thymus, which involutes after uh, you know, uh, being a small child, uh, lymph nodes, the spleen. There are all kinds of immune organs uh, throughout the body. And these are all responsible to work together to try and uh, uh, get rid of anything that isn't supposed to be in your body. Now, this is very simplistic, but there are really two immune systems, what's called innate immunity, and this is the first line of defense. And these are cells like your white cells, uh, macrophages, what are called natural killer cells that exist, dendritic cells, which present foreign material to these other cells, so they get rid of them. And this is a very rapid response. So if somebody has an infection, uh, this is the immune system that kicks in almost immediately. Uh, very quickly unless you're immunocompromised in some way. But it typically, this part of it doesn't have a long-lasting memory of the event. So then you have to have what's called adaptive immunity kick in. And this is where you have very specialized memory cells, uh, T cells and B cells, that are actually educated about what had happened in the past and then in turn can, with the innate immunity system, work together uh, in a more enhanced way. And there are a number of chemicals that these tissues secrete to enhance the effect and allow them to work together. And this is sort of a simplistic diagram, again, showing that if you have a pathogen, whether it's a, you know, uh, an infection of some sort, what's germane in this discussion is cancer cells, the first thing is why are you know, the, the white cells, the natural killer cells, eradicating the cancer? Why do we get it? Well, it's not sufficient, and even with innate immunity as it exists uh, by itself without some triggers, that's insufficient to get rid of cancer cells. And the reason that that happens is because there's a lot of controls that we understand, things that put the brakes on a cancer cell, and there are things, I'm sorry, things that put the brakes on T cells, 
that are responsible for getting rid of these things. We've also come to understand that there are things that are like a gas pedal that can amplify the effect that T cells have. And when you see these sort of, this nomenclature, these letters, these re really refer to uh, receptors that are present on T cells. And in drug development, there are now uh, efforts to either develop antibodies or other small molecules that either amplify the effect, push the gas on T cells so that they're better and more effective at uh, accelerating the immune system. Or what happens with cancer, and I think I put this in uh, one of the slides coming up, cancer cells can hide from the immune system by blocking, putting the brakes on the T cells. So if you can inhibit that, you can again release the immune system to do its job. So again, this is just sort of simplistically telling you that there are a number of different antibodies in development. Some are approved for other diseases uh, that you've probably heard about in melanoma and lung cancer. And these are either drugs that accelerate things or lift the brakes off the T cells. And one of the drugs that we heard about last year um, it was really targeting what we call one of these breaks, the PD-1 uh, that is expressed on activated uh, T cells. And what happens is the tumors, again, can co-opt this and actually stop the T cell from doing its job. So pembrolizumab, which is approved but not for breast cancer, was actually evaluated. This is an antibody, uh, antibodies being like the drug uh, trastuzumab or Perceptin, but they're very specific or developed in a very specific way for a, a, a specific target. And one of the trials that was done last year that got a bit of press was the use of this antibody with the goal of lifting the brakes off the immune system in patients with triple negative breast cancer. These were patients with very advanced disease. Uh, they had gone through lots of prior therapy and they were given the antibody. And cutting to the chase, if you sort of look at the overall response, uh, you know, you're not gonna get real excited about that all by itself, but this is an antibody alone in heavily pretreated patients, and it was essentially proof of principle mm -hmm. that you could target the immune system and have some patients benefit, and some of those patients actually had a benefit that was very prolonged. So we're not naive enough to think that any one of these things all by themselves are gonna be sufficient for affecting cancer. And to that end, you know, we, we always have this notion that chemotherapy will someday go away. Perhaps it will. But we also know that chemotherapy is very important probably for unmasking certain particular things about the tumor cell that then allow the immune system to act. So this was data that we presented at uh, the ASCO meeting a week ago. And again, tezolizumab, a long name, is another checkpoint inhibitor a drug targeting um, uh, the immune system. And the reason it's combined with Taxol, in this case, Naptaxol, is because it allows the expression of some of the surface abnormalities of the cancer cell, and that in turn allows the checkpoint inhibitor to work more effectively. So again, these are small trials of breast cancer at the present time, and they generally show proof of principle that in the red box, you do get patients responding perhaps more than you would expect them to with chemotherapy alone. And we're starting to interrogate, trying to figure out who are the patients that are most likely to benefit. And on the bottom right, it seems to be those patients who have the most apparent immune effect. So when you look at the tumor cells, are there lots of these immune cells present? Those are the patients most likely to get a response. I'm just gonna close with one other comment about vaccines because everybody, you know, is been very interested in vaccines for a very long time. Uh, there really is no vaccine for breast cancer, obviously. Uh, you know, the notion that they will likely work all by themselves, again, is probably not uh, realistic. I think that probably vaccines, if they're going to have an effect, will be used in conjunction with standard therapy.